giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We're going to get started uh, getting to a little, a little bit more about Team 2910. Uh, later on during the show, we will be uh, asking some questions that were submitted by you, the community, via our uh, Discord uh, server, our from Reddit and from Chief Delphi and social media. And uh, we will also take some questions submitted live in the chat throughout the show. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask 2910, uh, please post it in the chat and tag at first updates now. And we'll try to ask as many as those as we have time for. Uh, we're going to get started, though. We're going to start out with some basics. So we want first question we want to ask you guys is how is your team organized as far as personnel roles and uh, and how how different aspects of your team are covered? All right. So our team has a leadership team consisting of six student officers. Uh, we have two for engineering, the director of engineering and assistant director of engineering. Our two finances people are our ASP representative and treasurer and sponsor relations. And we have a media and marketing administrator and a team administrator. Uh, they help ensure that overall our team runs smoothly. And during build season, uh, we split our team up into sub teams so that we can get people working on what they'd like to work on. And it lets us organize our time and space a little bit better because um, we, yeah, we work in a small shop and so we don't have space for everybody. Um, yeah, each sub team has one or two student leads and a supporting mentor. And yeah, since we don't have a large shop to work in, we have had to make a schedule for who is allowed to be in the shop when. And having sub teams makes those groups very clearly defined, and it's very easy to make a schedule from there. All right. And um, how do you guys kind of approach um, maybe some of the funding for your team? So when it comes to sponsorship, um, and different ways you guys go about uh, raising money to support your program. So our team uh, is funded mostly by sponsorships. Um, every year we give uh, presentations to new and current sponsors. Um, just, you know, tell them about the team, what we do, um, and then sort of what first is. Uh, Boeing and Microsoft also have uh, sort of mentor hour matching programs, uh, which help a lot because we have a lot of mentors that work at Boeing and Microsoft. Um, and then our parent booster organization also helps out with fundraising efforts. Um, they do a pie fundraiser and a coffee fundraiser, and that uh, brings in quite a bit of money for them each year. So just as maybe like a follow up, how how did you guys go about um, like approaching some of those companies? You mentioned like Boeing and Microsoft. Um, did you guys kind of get hooked up with that just because of mentors that were already on the team? Or did you guys as a team earlier on kind of go and approach those those companies or, or some of the other one other sponsors you might have? And and maybe how what what can other lessons can other teams kind of take away on the best way to approach, you know, finding new sponsors? Yeah, so um, this year, uh, well, a lot Microsoft and Boeing uh, have been sponsors for quite a long time. Um, they, we started off, I believe, the Boeing grant uh, that came out. Um, but so how we approach new sponsors is first we look for you know, parents on the team who might be involved in a company that could potentially sponsor us. Uh, I know this year uh, there was a sponsor, Creo. Um, uh, there was a parent on the team that, was, uh, that worked there. And was, we you know, asked them, hey, uh, we'd like to give a presentation to you guys uh, if you guys would like to sponsor us. So that's we first go through the parents first, and then we look uh, elsewhere. Okay, cool. And uh, so then to move on to you know kind of the education for your guys's team, how, how does your team handle training and, and educating students on the team, uh, especially the newer students that are coming in, since there's so much turnover, you know, in the FRC world. Right. Um, so we are heavily focused on training in the fall. Um, so before we go to the shop, everybody um, has to pass some basic level safety training. So we have like classroom sessions where we go over um, basic shop tools and shop safety. And then everybody has to pass a pretty basic shape safety quiz. And then we start taking people to the shop and teach them how to use um, the basic tools like drills and various saws, belt sander and riveters, stuff like that. Um, in the fall, we also do CAD training. Um, we use SolidWorks, and our CAD training is usually taught by our lead CAD student, and they go through, uh, like it's like a couple times a week, and they go through 
all the fundamental stuff, we actually um, sort of borrow the curriculum from the University of Washington. One of those alumni has their stuff. Um, and then after that, it's kind of the basic stuff. I have do a couple sessions of more advanced SOLIDWORKS um, programming. Our, uh, in the fall, our lead programmer teaches about Java. So that was Jacob this year. And then um, new for us this year is media training. Um, as we're becoming more well known, we're trying to stay on top of that a little better. And um, this spring, I'm excited. We have a bunch of kids going to a local community college to learn basics of milling machines. That should be good. Awesome. So, so as a follow up, I think you had said um, that Jacob, you you led the the programming training for the last year. Could you maybe talk about you know some some techniques and some things you found have are kind of worked the best way on getting younger students to kind of learn from the older students and some of the best ways to maybe hand down some of that knowledge? Yeah. So um, programming. Uh, usually, what we do is we start. Uh, we don't go right into uh, robot programming. Uh, we start with just uh, teaching basic Java first. So uh, we have, uh, I take some exercises sometimes out of like AP computer science books um, for like uh, Java and stuff. And uh, yeah, so it's quite a long process still of like teaching Java. There's a lot to learn uh, and there's quite short amount of time to do it before uh, the season starts. Uh, so yeah. Okay. All right, and moving on to um, the next question, uh, what kind of things do you guys do both during the season and in the off season to help other teams as well as your community overall? Um, and how do these improve your team and your students in the process? All right, so we reach out to our school and community for outreach um, to make our students to help our students improve. We have a varsity letter program where one of the requirements is earning a certain number of volunteer hours within FIRST or the community. And so each year we host an FTC event. Um, and we, we highly encourage our team members to volunteer at local FLL events as well. Um, some of our team members actually mentor FLL teams. I personally mentor two at a local elementary school. I find that to be a lot of fun and it's good for varsity letters. Um, our school hosts a few events that we go to each year. Like at their freshman orientation, we have a barbecue lunch prepared each year. Um, yeah, we, we prepare a barbecue lunch um, and show off our robot. And then we are in various assemblies annually. And uh, the school hosts something called Oktoberfest, where clubs from around the school can show off what they're all about. And so we use that as an opportunity to show why robotics is a pretty good pathway in high school and after. Um, in our community, Last year we went to, or last summer actually, we went to Seafair down in Seattle. And we also attended the Edmonds 4th of July Parade with the 4911 Cyber Knights, if anyone knows who they are. Um, and some of our mentors and team members are, yeah, yeah, our mentors and team members are always happy to offer support to other teams when they need it, uh, like at competitions. At our Sundome event, I got to help a rookie team build their drivetrain. That was a lot of fun. Um, and we have, we have a bunch of programmers who are very skilled and have helped other teams with their code issues. And we're always happy to lend some parts when needed. All right. And I'm sure we'll we'll talk a little bit more in detail maybe a little later from some of our submitted questions about, um, you know, things like helping teams with sort of drives, stuff like that. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but moving on for now, how does your guys' team approach uh, kickoff every season? Uh, what does your team do that you think results in a more successful season compared to other teams? So um, uh, our kickoff sort of like we start uh, talk about kickoff before kickoff starts. Um, so every year, uh, like usually mid to late, usually mid December before school gets out uh, for winter break, uh, we get together as a team and we define, you know, what our goals are for the season. Um, and everything that we do during uh, build season and competition season, you have to be able to trace back to one of those goals. Um, we also uh, you know, discuss our team capabilities, you know, what we think we're uh, able to achieve during the season. And we put out some rough build deadlines. So like we want to get a drive base working by like uh, 
this day. And then we want to have the robot mostly like pretty much quote unquote complete um, by some other day. Um, at the day of kickoff, uh, we always start with a breakfast for everyone. Uh, so everyone can get here bright and early uh, because we're West Coast and uh, <laughs> it's really early. Um, after the manual is released, uh, everyone goes, sits down, we read, everyone re reads the manual. Um, and then we do the 1678 uh, rules test and everyone takes that. Um, after everyone's taken that and uh, passed it, uh, we, then we start talking about what the robot should, what we want the robot to be able to do. Uh, we don't talk about, uh, you know, how yet, just what. Um, and then we finish off the day by so, somewhat deciding uh, the direction that we want to go with our robot. So uh, this year, deciding we wanted to score low. Uh, the following, uh, the next few days, uh, that's when we start talking about how. Uh, so we draft out a couple prototypes that could be uh, used, and we start prototyping those in the shop. Okay, and uh, and as a follow up to the the what versus the how, so you know a lot of a lot of top teams definitely have mentioned this before. Uh, I think both of our previous guests, sixteen seventy eight and one ninety five, talked about it, and I know it's kind of common, but for a lot of people who maybe don't think it all the way through that way, I think that's a really important point. And I'm maybe curious, how do you guys go about deciding what the what things are before you get to the how? Do you guys just have a general conversation, or do you guys have some kind of uh, system? Like I know. Um, I know other teams will do like a, you know, a yes, no, maybe list. Well, they'll, they'll list out everything you possibly can do. And then like, you know, they'll start deciding, well, what do they think is a yes versus a no versus a maybe? Um, you know, that's just one example. I don't know if you guys have anything in particular you guys do for that. So I guess we, we try to base it as much on the scoring of the game and what we think will be a competitive robot. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, I was just curious. Um, and we... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So we really try to, like... And then we really try to uh, not overcomplicate it because we're, we're, we're not at the level of some crazy teams um, who, can, who can build these really complicated robots. We really want to focus on, like, what is a simpler thing we can do that will still be pretty competitive um right yeah almost looking at it like a like a return on investment kind of you know how much investment does it take to get that system built and how much it is going to give you as a return as far as winning goes um yeah i think that's really important so when it comes to being at the events then uh, what does your team do for scouting at your events and how do you utilize uh whatever information you decide to gather so for scouting um every single match we have six people watching the match each of them's watching one of the robots and they're recording uh various data onto these transparencies and then at the end of the match all the transparencies are handed to our data lead who enters then enters all the information into the our excel spreadsheets um and then this data goes into like two major different things um we use it for two different things. One is for like pixel list alliance selection stuff, and the other is to inform our pre-match strategy. Um, and I think that's the one that's probably most overlooked, but it's it's pretty important. So um, before we're gonna like a few few matches before our match is coming up, someone will take the data, the up-to-date data down to the pit where we have another uh, computer with our Tableau program and a printer set up and then we print out these scouting sheets um it was pulled up a second ago but it has basically kind of like a rundown of what the alliance is capable of and this is really good for um a lot of times like so we're working with the other alliances drive teams trying to figure out our strategy and this gives us a good idea of how good a shape we're in um if like we want, if we're thinking of playing defense, which robot would be the best robot to target because shutting them down would have the biggest effect on the point differential and various things like that. Um, and these kind of pre-match sheets, every event we've been to so far, we've sort of adjusted them to as we're learning more about what's important and stuff like that. And then... Um, 
So qualitative scouting is also important this year. Um, so we have, especially with the second pick, usually being picked as a defensive robot. Um, and that's a lot of stuff that our scouting data doesn't really capture well. So we do have a few people who go around looking at what drivetrains robots have and how reliable robots have been. And then we also take notes of which drive teams we've liked to work with and stuff like that. To, mm. Yeah. So is there is there anything you guys think, uh, maybe specifically for this season, do you think there's anything that you're paying attention to in a specific sense that maybe some other teams don't that can kind of give you an edge when it comes to either playing for a match or, you know, preparing your pick list? Is there anything that you guys are kind of keeping track of or paying attention to that maybe gives you a leg up on the rest of the competition? Or if uh, not, you know. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's anything like super different that we're looking at. Um, it's a lot of just scoring ability. And, you know, sometimes we do look at if they have a uh, compatible climb with us. Um, in the okay. case of sub teams like Apex, uh, we can climb with them. Um, so that does help, uh, in, especially when we're talking about line selection. Okay, awesome. So, and I think the biggest thing that, you know, I wanted to find out from you guys kind of coming into tonight, uh, at least personally, um, because you guys have kind of come, kind of burst onto the scene uh, in, in the in the world scale kind of in the last couple of years, um, what would you guys attribute to your team finding so much success in the last couple of seasons relative uh, to the team's first nine seasons? And yeah, okay. what changed? Yeah. So uh, in 2015, we were very fortunate to receive a workspace, like a dedicated workspace from our school district. We used to work out of a, a hallway outside of our coach's classroom. We got access to a portable on, at our neighboring middle school. Um, and that's awesome because it gave us, uh, which, like, it gave us a lot more space to work in. Um, and once we got it organized well, it's, yeah, since we've had it organized well now, it's, it's a very good place to work compared to a hallway. Um, we have also started to extensively use SolidWorks and just CAD in general to make good robots. Um, we've we've, um, we've CADed like 95-ish percent of our robot for the past two years. There are only a few things on the final product that you won't find in the CAD. And um, those are just small components. But yeah, our use of CAD has helped us make very... Uh, it's helped our robot models be very uh, similar to what we want them to do, and it makes manufacturing far easier. How much would you say in the past, before the last couple of years, were you guys doing compared to now, or if basically, at all? Basically none. I remember my okay. freshman year, I saw a CAD model of the robot at the end of build season, and it was just a drivetrain. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm fairly certain 2018 was when we first started using it at, in, in an extent that impacted our competitiveness. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then going hand in hand with our use of CAD and our new workspace, we have recently uh, obtained a CNC router and CNC mill, and we've been using those to make like our, our Mark I sort of module parts. They've, uh, they've been really helpful for making more precise parts than what can be done by hand, and they've helped our robots look and perform more professionally than in the past. Yeah. Okay. Um a few more things that I think have really helped us over the past couple of years. We've had a lot more formalized build season timeline. Um, so Tuesday, Tuesday of uh, week two is when we try to have our drive base driving, like all built, wired up, um, and actually driving. Um, so with a swerve drive, it's like it's. We, we don't even exactly need to have the exact size of the drive base figured out. We can It's just mm -hmm. like reverse the chassis with the modules in the corners. Um, Friday of week three, we try to have CAD basically ready to go out for fabrication. Um, we kind of missed that by a few days this year, but it turned out okay. And then um, Friday of week five, we try to have the robot done in in quotations because it's it's never really finished but um the 4911 cyber knights have this unveiling night which we sort of try to get the robot done by uh, it was canceled this year due to bad weather but 
Um, we really try to, so if you get it done by Friday of week five, you have a week and a half to, um, to make it better. And it never works like you want it to the first time. Um, like our, our hatch mechanism that's in our reveal video is, is way different than the one we showed up to our week one event with. And the, the second one um, works a lot better. Um, sure. And I think another thing we have really dialed in is kind of knowing our capabilities and being realistic about what we can accomplish and actually achieve these sort of aggressive deadlines. Um, yeah, so a lot for us, like we don't have the bandwidth to do the to do a super complicated robot. There's just too much um, things for us to design and stuff. So, sure. Um, yeah, and we know like during the build season, we kind of know what we should be working on. Like we should be spending our time working on game specific manipulator design. Um, like not designing swerve modules and stuff like that. So like all the swerve modules or the ones we've used the past few years were all designed in the off season. Um, and I think yeah. another key, yeah. Another key thing this past year we've had uh, or past few years, we sort of have a good group of mentors coming together. And I don't know, when the mentors are knowledgeable and excited, the students also tend to be that way. Yeah, I, I got a, just a question real quick. Can you explain this picture? Do you guys not have heat in your shop, or what's going on with this? <laughs> uh, that was in the middle of what a lot of teams have called Snowmageddon, unless I'm mistaken. That's when it happened. Um, it was like we kind of have heat in our shop. We have a little space heater, but the built-in one in the shop doesn't really work. It just kind of makes everything colder when it does work at all. <laughs> um, so... Most of the time, the shop is bearable. The space heater really helps, but that was like a little more extreme. That was when it was like six inches of snow at least outside. <laughs> yeah, school was canceled for like over a week um, this during the build season, but we were very fortunate to still be able to get to the shop. Yeah, there's a lot of teams this year, I think, that definitely had to deal with not being able to be in their shop, so uh, that's definitely lucky. Um, one, one other maybe follow-up question that I kind of had was, um, how did your guys' team um, deal with communication throughout the season, and, and how do you guys all keep connected? How does everyone stay on the same page? I know some teams use Slack. Like I know our team uses Slack. Other teams use maybe Discord or other kind of systems like that. Do you guys have anything in particular, or do you just kind of keep it all in person, or do you guys have anything like that? Uh, so we use Slack. Um, we've been using Slack for a couple of years, and um, yeah, we mainly use that to stay uh, – connected with everyone on the team, make announcements, uh, say when meetings are going to end up being, if there's like meetings when there's not usually meetings, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, uh, like how, how detailed do you guys break it down? Like, do you guys have a bunch of different channels for all the different kind of subtopics or do you guys just have like a few just to keep on a general same page? Yeah, we, we have, have um, yeah. okay, go, go for it, Jacob. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have a, um, we have channels for, uh, the programming, um, electrical and mechanical um, and then we also have some other channels uh, like we have an announcements channel uh, and then there's uh, sometimes different channels for like when we we're making our designing our new pit in the off season we had a channel for the pit uh, we have channels for we have a channel for scouting uh, that kind of stuff awesome all right we need your help to keep fun loud live and independent Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.